This is Louie, and this is Louie's roadmap to, roadmap to success. Um, right there, I gave him a treat. Remember, every time you give him a treat, the treat should go in the mouth first, and you should hear the command word immediately after it goes in the, in the mouth, not before. Um, all right, so um, he's a great dog, um, telemarketer probably, um, but he's a great dog, but uh, he, as you can see here, he just doesn't have any boundaries, and he's a little bit impolite. Um, it's not that he's mean or uh, I don't assign it as negative as he's a naughty dog. He just doesn't know any better. The guardians have done a great job of exercising better than most of my clients, have more rules than most of my clients, but still needs more. So um, we're going to talk about all the things. Uh, we're going to try to summarize all the things we talked about in the session. So we first start talking about exercise. Um, we can set him up for success. We have grandkids that come over. And so when the grandkids come over, if we have an exercise in first, that's, he's going to unleash that energy on the grandkids. Sit. Sit. So what I would do is, be, um, uh, start, what I recommend is starting an exercise journal. So basically, get a piece, of, uh, a notebook, write down the day at the top, write down the time and how long the walk was, you know, 20, 30 minutes. And then a couple hours, and then you feed him breakfast, write down that. Um, uh, a couple hours later, he starts pawing at you. When he does this sort of thing, I mean, I have treats here, this is a little different, but he comes and mouths you, grabs your arm or something like that, or barks at you. He's being rowdy. Instead of saying naughty, we should interpret that as his way of saying, I need, I have too much energy. I need to burn some off some of this excess energy. And some of the ways that we can do that would be to throw the treats up and down the stairs like we talked about. Um, remember, each down up is one. And assign a funny command word. Going down, we say lobby. Going up, we say penthouse or whatever the word is you want to call it. You know, stream and mountain or whatever. Um, all right, so the other one is chasing the laser. Another one would be uh, fetch, which he really likes fetching. Um, when you play fetch, make sure that he drops the ball and sits before, at first just drop before I pick it up and throw it. Once he's consistently dropping it, then we want to basically, there you go, buddy. That's a good cra crash. And try not to say good crash, just say crash. Um, another one, you know, fetch is a wonderful way to do it. Um, so at first he has to drop the ball before you pick it up and throw it. And once he starts dropping it consistently, then you ask him to drop, uh, drop it and then tell him to sit and then pick it up and throw it. So we're just adding more and more to this. Um, his nails are long. I'm feeling them right now. And they, uh, if a dog's nails get too long, they can actually splinter and split down the middle. And sometimes they have to be amputated. They don't grow back like ours do. And so uh, I would look into getting his uh, nails done uh, and keeping them short. He's a light-coated dog, so his should be probably translucent. Let's take a look. So you want to just go through the white part. You can see that, well, his, yeah, his quicks are pretty long. And so if you get a Dremel, you can actually Dremel it and get, make the quick go back. But they're pretty long, so I'd, I would worry about that. Um, okay, so um, exercise options. Throwing the treats up and down the stairs, playing fetch, um, uh, the laser, uh, going for a walk. Um, even scent games. Scent games would be with a SC, with a smell. So maybe hiding some treats room, he's got to go find them. Now, he's very determined, and he's just used to pawing at it. So teaching him a leave it command, which I have these videos on my website on how to teach a dog to leave it, would be a good idea. Yes, thank you, buddy. Um, uh, okay, so um, so for the exercise journal, write down the time and how much exercise you got. him. Also, the rowdy behavior, what time and what he was doing with a little bit of detail, maybe a couple words to a sentence or two. And then, um, and then feeding times and uh, all the exercise throughout the day. And at the end of the day, give him a letter grade, A through F. The next day, play around with the elements. Um, throw a couple more fetches or a whole extra game of fetch. Ideally, most dogs need uh, exercise every two to four hours. Um, uh, a bigger exercise burst in the, or, or activity uh, in the evening and in the morning. Uh, dogs have big energy uh, bursts at those times. And so, uh, and again, before we have people come over, make sure we exercise the heck out of them. Maybe before we have people come over, maybe we go for an hour walk. And then we do, and then uh, after he comes back, we give him 10 minutes, 15 minutes recover. Then we do the stairs. Then we give him a little bit of time to recover. Then we do the laser. Then we do a little bit of time to recover, and then we play fetch. And by the time the kids come over, we've already, you know, he's like, man, I'm, I would jump up on you, but I gotta catch some seeds. So we put him in a position to succeed. Uh, now, you can also use the leash, like I, like I mentioned uh, off camera. Thank you, buddy. Um, but we don't want to use the leash unless we need to. I would prefer that you create the scenario that we have in the video above of uh, making the entry to the dining room a little bit smaller so that grandpa or anybody, and you guys should take turns practicing enforcing the boundaries. I want to listen to both of you guys. And again, when he's rowdy like this, now he wants the treats in my hand, but that should be interpreted as he needs some fetches or some up-downs on the stairs or whatever it is. Um, so keep that exercise journal for about a month. Crash. Uh, and by then you should know what uh, forms of exercise and how much he needs in order to uh, be in a position to succeed. Unless we have guests or something else where we're going to set him up for success. 
Um, okay, we also talked about rules or lack of rules. Now, he's not allowed in the furniture, which is usually something a lot of people give me a hard time about. Uh, but uh, for dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank they have. So that's a good one. I would recommend getting some dog beds or at least uh, carpets like this that we put in every room that we hang out in so we can teach him to go there on the command. Now, to teach a dog to go on their command, what I would do is just go like this. So let him see that when he come over here. Let's show that I have a treat, drop it, and when he comes on it and gets it, I say Jamaica or Hawaii or Cabo or whatever, you know, uh, Pandora, you can, Australia, you can call it anything you want. I usually like using a destination, but you can use any word you want. So what we're doing is basically saying, when you come over here, when he hears Jamaica, comes over here, stands on it, and then has a treat in his mouth. So I go here and I get a treat, and I hear the word Jamaica. And after we do that enough, then he starts wanting to come here more and more often. So I would want it to do this, I usually grab about 10 treats, throw one on here when there's nobody here, let him come over and lick it up and save the command word, and each one should have its own designation. Maybe this is Jamaica. Maybe that one's St. Mark's. Maybe the other one is Honolulu, if you're going with that island thing. And so I toss the treat on it, he goes over and licks it up, and when he's standing on it and licks up after the treat goes in his mouth, I say the word Honolulu, and then let him walk away, and then throw another treat. I do that 10 treats in a row, five times a day. And after two or three days, he'll just start hanging out in that place. Now you can also lead him, uh, leave a treat here, and just when he comes over and just watch him, don't point it out. When he comes over and licks it up, say the word Honolulu. Or you can tell him to sit, and then give him a treat and say Honolulu. Or lay him down and give him a treat and say Honolulu. That's the first week. These are all ways to entice him to come here. After a week then, he starts, should start hanging out there on his own. When he does come and lay down here, we would go over and pet him and give him a treat and say the word Honolulu. So at first is to entice him, then it's to reward him for doing it. Um, and I, like I said, I would have one in every room that you go to, and after a while you could say, no, Jamaica, and he runs to the other room and goes to Jamaica. That's a little flirting, shoving his butt at someone or another dog. Um, okay, so um, let me see, other, uh, uh, let me see, we we're talking about uh, rules. Uh, so not being allowed in the furniture, it shouldn't be allowed in the kitchen or preparing food. The video above, I talk about how you can set that up to help the dog practice. Also, it should be around the, in the dining room when we're eating food there. If we're eating at the work island behind me, then uh, he shouldn't be within seven feet of there. So if the kids are coming over, we should have them practice eating a snack each time they come over so we can help them practice that. Um, and then don't forget to practice with the bacon or the roast beef like I explained off camera uh, or in the video above so you can help him practice. And you only have to do that for a week or two. After a while, he'll just come and sit behind the boundary and lie down. He understands I'm not allowed to go in there. That's wonderful. Uh, okay, we also, uh, other rules we talked about, not being, uh, have him sit before I let him out of the door. Um, go to the door and say, sit once. If he doesn't sit within three seconds, walk away. <coughs> sit down nearby, okay? Sit down nearby, and then, oh, you're a big boy. There we go. Uh, I'm gonna do this. Um, and then sit down nearby so he can see you, and then wait for one minute. After one minute, go back to the door and tell him to sit. If he, nope, I'm gonna keep you here for a second. And then if he doesn't sit this time, I'll walk away for two minutes. Within three seconds, he doesn't sit. I walk away for two minutes, then for four minutes, then for eight minutes. Each time I walk away, I double the length of time. And as soon as I go to the door and say sit, and he sits, boy, I fly back. I don't say pet him. I don't pet him. I just say good boy. I open the door as fast as I can. That's the reward. And after you do that enough, he'll go sit at the door as his way of asking go out. First do it with whatever direction he wants to do, then do it with both directions. Um, also, make sure that he's not running out a door ahead of you. Um, if you want to teach him to wait at an open door, that's another great way to develop some self-control. Um, let me see. Um, when we're coming home, I kind of showed how to claim the area around the door. Now, I would recommend that the guardians practice that. So when you guys are coming home, call or text each other when you're a block or two away. Want to do the door exercise? Sure. Park on the street. Don't park in the garage. Walk up to the door. Ring it like you're a, uh, a stranger. And then when he runs, goes to the door, we march towards him, put our back to the door, walk directly to the dog, march him up those steps, then take one step backwards and pause. If he comes down, we take a rush at him. If he stays put, put on, on the top step, then we take two steps backwards. I'm walking backwards, facing him. And I stop between each step. And eventually I get all the way to the bottom of the steps, he stays there. Then I would turn the deadbolt to the handle while I keep my hips pointed towards him and make the sounds that are associated with the door opening. I twig it deadbolt over and over until he stays put. Then I slap the handle till he stays put. Then I open the door a crack till he stays put. And if at any point he stops and he starts to come down, I stop, I close the door, I stop doing what I'm doing, I rush at him and I keep rushing at him until he gets across at, uh, onto the top of the step. And I keep doing that over and over again when there's nobody else here. Uh, and, or when, nobody, uh, when it's just one of us. Now something else you could do has every once in a while when your dog, you're hanging out with your dog? That wasn't a great knock, but you see the response that we got from him. 
So normally the ding, the ding dong of the doorbell happens and I go to the door or I hear the knock and then you guys go to the door. See, he's looking at the door. Well, if we do this, even if he sees me do it, nobody's coming through the door. So uh, that's that flirting I was talking about. So basically, this is, this is that's actually, a, he's trying to have fun. He's trying to play with me. Um, so uh, some of my clients actually will hire a kid in the neighborhood. Hey, everyone, what's going on? When you're coming home from school, can you walk up to our door and just ring the doorbell when you're coming home from school? He's like, are you serious? Yeah. And when the doorbell rings, he barks and runs to the door, but nobody else gets up. And nobody comes in through the door. And after, and again, this should be interpreted as I need some exercise. Um, but then he's like, well, doorbell, it just rings now for some reason, for no reason, and I'm not gonna go get it. And then when it does ring, and it's a real good guess, we're not using the doorbell as not something that's triggering him to get all worked up. Um, okay, so um, let me see, we also talked about petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is like this. He wants my attention. Well, I would have, sit. Sit, sit. I prefer to pat on the chin. We can pat anywhere, just avoid patting on top of the head. Um, and I'm gonna say just the word sit. So I say sit when he demands attention on me, I tell him to sit. If he sits, then I reward him. If he doesn't sit within three seconds, then I move away or do something else. I don't get mad, I don't yell, and I certainly don't repeat the command word over and over again. What I'm saying is when I ask you to do something, if you do it once, you'll get a reward. If you don't do it right away, I got other things going on. And after a while, you know, if you're put, this is kind of a form of playing aloof, which is definitely something you guys should do. Well, if I don't sit, he just finds something better to do. Okay, he said he wants more milk bones. No, don't give him milk bones. Milk bones have yellow dye number five in it. It's a known carcinogen. We'll give your dog cancer. Um, but basically what we want to do is we want to set him up for success by teaching him the behaviors that we want. So um, if he uh, comes and nudges me and he demands attention and I pet him, I'm rewarding that. And I'm telling him, yes, you're the boss of me. So instead, when he nudges me, I give him a counter order, tell him to sit. When he sits, I pet him under his chin, say the word sit, and only the word sit. I can pet him as long as I want after that. Now, if he's already sitting, I ask him to come and sit over here or ask him to lay down. He has to do something to change his state or prepay for that attention. That's what he'll start doing. He'll start coming and sitting in front of you saying, well, I'm, sitting. I'm sitting, can you pet me? And we definitely should do that as much as possible. If we don't, then he's just gonna go back to pawing at you or Lily, now, I'm not giving him a treat because that would be rewarding him, but a dog cannot sniff and bark at the same time. So if I'm holding treats in my hand, he can't bark. He's probably going to paw at it and bite my hand. So it's, or, but we're not shushing because and remember, any attention is good attention. Sit. Crash. Using fun command words can actually provide extra motivation for your dog. So I would have, since we have a lot of grandkids, I would have, every time we teach him a new trick or a new command or whatever it is, Tell all the grandkids, maybe just switch families if we have multiple families of grandkids, I'm guessing we do. Okay, we need a word that means to lay down. So I want all the kids to come up with a word and then tell mom and dad, and then mom and dad will tell grandma and grandpa, and then grandma and grandpa will decide which word we want to use. And eventually the kid, each one of the kids has a word or two that uh, is a dog command. That makes them more engaged with the dog. And it's just kind of funny, especially if you use funny command words, because dogs can make a facial expression. If I say crash and my dog flops down, it probably makes other people laugh and smile. It does, and it motivates the dog to want to do that. Now, uh, when the dog does come up and starts sitting down to prepay, we want to make sure that we are recognizing and rewarding that. Otherwise, the dog will go back to doing what he used to do, which is what he's doing now. Crash. That's passive trade, which we're going to talk about in a sec. Um, so basically, for petting with a purpose, if he tells me what to do, nothing happens because I don't recognize him as a leader. But if I tell him what to do and he does it, I reward him. So that helps him recognize me as the leader. And also, I'm motivating him to want to do it because he gets a reward. So I know. And so basically, the more that we pet with a purpose, after a while we get to the point, and this is petulance, he's basically up at throw a temper tantrum, give me treats. So basically, um, you know, the more we pet with a purpose, the more he'll start prepaying by sitting, and or if he doesn't, we're, automa we're redirecting him. So we're teaching him, sitting gets my attention, laying down gets my attention, bringing me a beer from the fridge gets my attention. Um, most of us trainer dogs misbehave, because when it steals remote control, we get up and chase it. If it barks, we tell it no. If it jumps on the grandkids, we chastise it. Well, for dogs, any attention is validating. So if he's doing something wrong and that was, that's the best way to get the attention from me, that's what he's gonna continue doing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to get to that part. But when we do petting with a purpose, now we're teaching, him, we're teaching him these are good things that you can do that will get my attention. Now we're gonna use paycheck if you suspect somebody's petting without a purpose and you can't argue, you just have to stop petting, tell them to sit or lay down or whatever it is and then pet him and then explain to the other person, I did it right, you missed it. 
Um, now, uh, the offshoot of this is what I call passive training, which was what I just said I'd reference in a minute. Passive training, this I guess technically isn't quite passive training because I do have treats in my hand. Uh, but what it is, is you're waiting for the dog to voluntarily offer you the behavior or the activity that you want, and then you name it and reward it. So every time the dog comes to me, I should pet him and say, come. I didn't ask him to come. I didn't show him I have a treat. I had no influence over that whatsoever. He did it on his own volition. But when he did, the end result is still what I want. So I reward him for doing that. And the more that I do that, the more he's going to be inclined to want to do that. And uh, if you get in the habit of petting, and come up with a word for that. I used to say testify, but recognize, reward, whatever word it is. Hey, the dog just did something. You know, you, you're missing an opportunity to pet him. Testify. And then come, or whatever the command word is. Oh, you got to you cut me a little bit, or you ripped off a scab. That's all right. Um, I think it was a scab. Um, yes, is that because you didn't really treat fast enough? Um, okay, so um, let me see. Um, I wanted to come up with, uh, yes, thank you. Um, so basically, I want to do, uh, uh, if you get in a habit of petting with purpose and passive training, every time you pet your dog, it becomes a training session, and the dog will start offering those behaviors over, over and over and over again. One thing I was going to ask is, um, uh, I guess Grandpa's back here to answer it for me. How many to chew toys does he have? Four or five. Uh, four or five. Okay. I ask people, like, how many chew toys? A lot of people will tell me, like, oh, too many. Um, you definitely don't want the blood, buddy. Um, somebody asked me once, if once, I heard once a dog tastes blood, he's bloodthirsty. BS. Uh, so basically, your average, your dog should have a minimum of 20 toys at any one point. If I don't have something to chew on, I'm going to chew on the human. I'm going to, you know, chew the scab off or whatever it is. So, um, and when dogs get, uh, get stressed out or are bored, they like to chew things. So, and unfortunately, you're fortunate that he hasn't chewed the wrong things because usually they just start chewing your furniture. So, things that I like to get dogs to chew on antlers, uh, nyla bones, real bones. Uh, your dog can have bones as long as they're not cooked. If they're cooked, they can break off and uh, cause damage. Um, I also like a water buffalo horn. That's a very robust and expensive toy, uh, but it'll probably outlast the dog. Now, it'll smell a little bit the first week or so that you have, but after a while, it won't smell, but he will love chewing on that. Um, but getting him appropriate chew toys, you can get him some plushies and some tug toys as well. But you want to get, and I, I usually avoid squeakers, but you can. But giving him a, a plethora of toys to chew on gives him something to preoccupy himself and keep himself in control. Um, and like I said, 20 or, is what we want to get. And for nylo bones, everybody gets a nylo bone that looks like the, the skeleton bone that actually doesn't look like, it's not, we don't have any bones like that in our body. Uh, regular bones are going to be long and uh, oval and, have a, and be hollow. So basically, when you get one of those, make sure the, uh, uh, or uh, if you get a, uh, the nylo bones, come in different flavors and different shapes. So when you get the, I would get a barbecue one, a bacon one. I have one that looks like a forearm, one that looks like a, a dinosaur of some sort, one that looks like a donut, one that's a letter Y. Uh, they have all sorts of different shapes and flavors and colors. So get a variety of those. Um, and then uh, you also might want to get them some ingestibles. So ingestibles would be like bully sticks, um, cow kneecaps, cow ears, uh, tracheas, cow cheeks, uh, cod skins, uh, chicken feet, duck feet, uh, uh, turkey feet, and heads. Um, all these things are great things for dogs to chew on. You should not give your dogs raw hides. They're soaked in bleach, ammonia, and a lot of other nasty chemicals because the dog ingests them. Studies show that they can actually lead to some health problems. One of uh, uh, one in every two dogs dies of cancer, and so it's, if, most of it is what we feed them. Uh, a couple treats never to feed your dog. Milk bones, like I mentioned earlier, have yellow and dye number five, which creates hyperactivity and has uh, no carcinogen. FDA won't allow it for humans, but USDA has not won it. Um, snausages, S-N-A-U-S-S-A-G-E-S. -E um, milk bones, I mentioned. Uh, pepperoni, begging strips. Um, those are four of the five most popular types of dog treats, and all of them have a known carcinogen in them. Now, things that uh, help prevent would be uh, carrots, have a known cancer-fighting uh, ingredient to them, and uh, broccoli florets, which is the uh, uh, flower part at the top of the bro bro broccoli stalk. So I give my dogs a carrot as a bone about every other day. It's dense, they can chew on it, and they can eat it, and there's a little sugar in it. And I also give my dogs uh, the broccoli florets. I like usually demolish one of those on top of my dog's food once a week, just prophylactically to provide something to help fight cancer. Um, so one of the other rules, speaking of eating, should be the human should eat before they feed the dog. Yes, I know he says he likes the chicken. Um, but basically when we feed him, make, dogs eat in the order of the rank. So we should eat something first and then you would not, actually what I would do is I'd put the food down in the kitchen where you feed him and not allow him in the kitchen the same way we did that activity in the video above. 
And then once he once the food's down, then I lean against the counter and I eat something in five more bites because I'm the leader. Dogs eat the order of their rank. When I get done eating, then I invite him over to come and eat, and we take his first bite of food. I would use pastor training to give him a command word. Then we say lasagna every time he takes a bite of food. So when he hears the word lasagna, there's food in his mouth. After a while, lasagna means to eat. And after about two months, you'll be able to say lasagna, and he goes and eats it. But he's not allowed to eat until he gets permission to eat, and there's food in the bowl, and there's nothing blocking between him and the bowl. So that's a wonderful way to de develop that self-control through delayed gratification like I talked about off camera. Um, and then uh, after the human eats first, then we would give him permission to eat. Sit. Sit. When the dog knows the command, I say it twice. Sit during the command stage and sit after the treat goes in the mouth during the reward stage or when I pet. Um, so basically, um, uh, once he, it, it's his turn to eat and I give him permission, if he walks over and sniffs his bowl, he says, I don't feel like eating, walks away. Once he walks seven more paces away, pick up his bowl, dump it empty, but importantly, put the empty bowl back down on the ground. We want to recognize that when I, when, if I walk away from the bowl, when I, the, bowl the food disappears. And that way, every time that I'm being fed, you can't get the blood on you, buddy. Uh, every time that I'm fed, um, I either eat after the humans or I don't eat at all. And don't have any sympathy if you pull his food because you're giving him an opportunity. If he's walking away, some dogs will be, make this a who blinks first scenario. Oh, you want me to eat? So by, my, by not eating, then I control the power. If you don't want to eat, buddy, that's up to you. You're going to get hungry enough and you will have to eat. So I'm giving you an opportunity. If you don't want to eat, that's on your tab, not on my tab. And eventually, he'll start waiting for, and eating after you. Now, remember, you eat something first. It doesn't have to be an actual meal. Just five more bites of something solid. It can't be a smoothie or coffee. You don't understand that as food. Um, let me see. What else do we want to cut? <laughs> oh, yes, the escalating consequences. So remember, hiss, number one. Number two, stand up abruptly, turn to face him, keep him in front of you until he stops moving. Stand, sits, or lies down. As soon as he does that, take two steps backwards and only two steps. Pause for one second and put a period at the end of the sentence. Crash. Um, passive training right there. Um, and then uh, and then at that point, I can go back to my, whatever I was doing. However, if what you were doing was se being seated, he, when you sit down, he'll probably come and challenge you again. So he does just stand right back up and repeat the process. The third consequence is to march deliberately at the dog. So we march to run at the dog. And if the dog's there, when you get there, don't slow down and don't stop, run right into him. And don't shove walk him, just walk through him as if he's not there. And this is a general rule. I'd like you to get in the habit of not walking around him if he's standing. Walk through him as if he's invisible. You'll bump into him a couple times. You might step on his paws a couple times. We don't want to hurt him. But want him to, you know, I, told, I said I didn't want to hurt you. Uh, but we'd want him to understand that we're not moving. We're not deviating our course. His job as a follower is to get out of our way as opposed to us getting out of his way. And the more that we do this with uh, the primary humans, then when other humans come, if they're human walking towards them, my job is get up and get out of their way. Uh, yes, that didn't feel good. Um, okay, so um, let me see. Um, so the third consequence is to march deliberately at the dog until it turns sideways or greater away from you. As soon as it does, then you want to stop in place, and then you go to the second consequence. You pivot in the hips as long as it's moving around. When he's stationary, take a, you uh, take two steps backwards, pause for one second, and then go back to doing what you what it is you were doing before. And again, if you sit, he probably is going to challenge you again. Crash. Um, and the only time that doesn't apply is if the dog's in a designated no dog zone when they, when they turn. So if we're saying the dog's not in the kitchen and we march at him and he's supposed to be over there and he turns sideways here, I would just collide into him, keep bumping into him until he crossed the threshold. And then once you get to the threshold, stop enforcing at the point of contact so that way he can understand that I'm not allowed to cross that threshold. As soon as I do, he corrects me. Um, but we stop enforcing at that point. That's how they learn where it is. Remember, if he, is, he keeps on tr probing over and over, he's being thorough. Don't get mad and don't get exasperated. Like, oh, great, another opportunity to teach him. And remember, breaking the rules is not a reward. It's confusing for dogs. One of the things I'd recommend you guys do is <coughs> come up with a list of the official command words and tape them in the refrigerator and say, what you have if, if I say, if I want to come in, I say, come here. And he comes, that's fine, but the word should be come or here, not come here. So we want to use just whatever the command word is exclusively. If most of us give 10, uh, 10, 10 command expressions to each command uh, action. Come, here, come here, come here, over here, here boy, dog's name, dog nickname, tap my thigh, something else. Now he's got to listen for 10 words for each command. If he knows 10 commands, that's 100 words he has to listen to. We say between 2,000 and 11,000 words a day as humans. That's a lot of words to listen and parse through. So the more, the easier we make it for him, the easier it is. And if we're going to come up with these funny command words that the grandkids are going to come, have it on the fridge and just write, you know, crash Billy. You know, and so we know Billy's the one that came up with that command word. Billy's like, yeah, I'm the one, I'm the crash boy. 
But again, it make him feel more engaged with the dog. Now, we did a little exercise after uh, the videotape, uh, video, I keep on saying videotape, we don't have tape anymore, but uh, the video above, where we had the kids come over and pet him and interact with him one at a time. That's a wonderful thing to do, but don't fight it. If he's all running around and full of beans, that's not the time to do that. There might be times the kids come over and they don't get a petting because he's being rambunctious. Remember, if we're petting him, we're rewarding him, or for the kids, we're saying thank you. Now, um, if, you, if you forgot and you want to do that, uh, give them a treat every time. Uh, they give the kids an m and every time they do that, let me know. Basically, you just give them a jar for each kid. And every time they tell the dog to do something, like sit. And then pet them and say, sit. And they can say, Grandma, I just I pet him with a purpose. Or I, said, I pet him and say, thank you. They can m and and put it in, in, their, in Billy's jar. And then at the end of the visit, Billy gets all the M&Ms or he gets some dessert or however you want to do it. Make sure you keep that dog stuff only. I have parents that say, like, oh, you didn't make your bed. You're going to lose your M&Ms. Well, the kid just stops doing it. Now, you can take the th use the threat of taking away. Oh, you, you pet it without a purpose. I have to take this M&M away. Would you like to do something to earn this pet? <coughs> Sit. Sit. Okay, I can put the M&M back. So you give the ability or the illusion of being able to take them away from the, uh, from the child if they're doing the wrong thing. But that gives you the ch children in action added motivation. Also, when he's around the kids, you know, the kids should have treats or petting him for the right thing. Now the kids are motivated or the dog's motivated to listen to the kids and sees the kids acting like a leader because they're, they only pet me when I do things that they want. And the more that this happens, the more they're going to have a habit of continuing to do so. All right, is there anything else uh, that I covered that you want me to... Highlight? I think it's wonderful, Dave. I've just really been listening. It's a good summary and a good review. And well, you're going to be able to watch this many times. And so when you're watching this, you're actually over there now, but you'll be watching it a little later. <laughs> uh, but don't hesitate. If you have any questions or things not working, call me. And that's a good point to mention. You're going to find he's going to make progress. All of a sudden, he's going to revert. And I get panic phone. Oh, it's not working anymore, David. What do I do now? Stay the course. Doug, just remember. I remember what it was like when I pawed at you and then you gave me attention. I like that. Let's go back to that. Doesn't work. After a while, he'll go back to the other way. Usually it's just a little test. If you stay consistent, it'll work. But if you do have questions or problems, please call me or text me. I'm going to give you my number right when we get out of finishing this video. Hopefully you program it in your phone and program Dog on Problems for the company name. You will forget my name in six months when you need it. You just can search for dog and I'll always come up on your phone. If I don't hear from you, I assume that means everything's going great. I tell every one of my clients I want them to call me. It's pretty normal to make a phone call or a text message or two afterwards, but I've had people call me five or seven years after the session, able to help them with a quick phone call without needing another session. All right, normally I would call the dog over, but he's been uh, uh, busy, so he's outside doing some business. So this is Louie, uh, who is, uh, I was able to remember because that's my grandpa's name, Grandpa AJ. Um, anyways, uh, this is Louie's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.